what does mean the light to me? Quality, well-being, but also unpredictability. Daylight is a powerful yet poetic source of energy. Daylight is the spirit of architecture. One of the very basic potentials of daylight is that it puts us in touch with our environment. Even a small, very carefully placed window can create the most powerful and poetic space. And thereby, this combination of architecture and daylight creates this metaphysical and metaphorical experience, which can become quite magic. Today, there's no limit on how we can bring daylight into architecture. And in Scandinavia, we try to let as much possible light in. Our interest lies in how daylight can bring life to material and also the possibilities in spaces and atmosphere with daylight. So why does daylight matter? It matters because if you let the light touch you, if you learn to observe, to appreciate, and to respect the power of daylight, then daylight can put you in touch with our natural environment. So for me, daylight is a perfect example that shows how our mother nature continues to foster creativity and becomes the fundamental source of inspiration for art and design communities. Never bored with the light. Uh, hello, my name is Michael Voest uh, and uh, they also asked me what daylight means uh, to me. Uh, I work with light research and uh, architectural lighting and, and light artworks. And uh, I find that daylight is the ultimate form giver to, um, uh, to experience uh, everything around us, uh, as well as uh, a good means to, um, uh, to work with uh, how daylight affects our well-being, uh, both psychological and uh, uh, physical. Thanks. <laughs> Natalia Giraldo Vasquez. I'm a postdoc researcher at uh, DTU, Technical University of Denmark. And daylight for me, it's a shaper. Uh, in a non-material sense, it shapes behaviors and cultures and habits. And in a more tangible way, it shapes buildings and spaces and also our relationship with our special uh, experience. Yeah, and that's Nico Gentile, Lund University, Sweden. Uh, what does it mean to me? I think that we have a craving for daylight uh, in so many aspects of our life, that daylight is actually just what I want personally, what everybody wants. Hello. Nobody asked me what daylight means to me. I know it's, <laughs> it's new to me actually, but I now realise it means that I, it's visible to everyone that I'm bald. Um, <laughs> anyway, good afternoon, or good evening I should say, it's um, just evening time right now. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you, those of you present here in the hall and those of you following the transmission from afar, because this one is going out international. So, in a way, this is the uh, architectural version of Eurovision. Um, you know, no dancing, no singing, no fancy dress, but it is going out to a lot of people. So welcome to those of you present here in the House of Architecture. And once again, welcome to those of you following us from various international destinations. My name is Adam Holm, and I'll be um, not entertaining, but moderating today's event for the next hour and a half. Um, we are gathered, I need not remind anyone, we are gathered here to celebrate and pay homage to the community working in the field of daylight, that is, you and you from afar. Uh, and we're here in particular, let us not forget that, to applaud the laureates who will receive the Daylight Award, a prestigious international award that honours and supports daylight research and daylight in architecture. The award puts specific emphasis on the interrelation between theory and practice, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're about to see later on, because the Joyful, I'm sure, laureates will each present a lecture of approximately 10 minutes. So we'll get 
the great opportunity to listen and watch and learn from theory and practice. Look, I so wish I could point out the happy laureates, but I'm, uh, I'm duty bound not to, so it will remain a secret for a few more minutes, but uh, I will be nodding in their direction. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, we'll also get the chance not just to listen to their lecture, but also to have them engaged in a Q&A, because the laureates will be up here with me on stage a little later for Q&A. And as I will remind you later on, you can join with questions. We are here gathered in this forum because of the Velux Foundation. They have generously and with great vision made this day and this award possible. And in order to enlighten us, I should say, a little more on the Daylight Award, what it entails and how it um, was conceived, I'm very happy, and I hope you'll join me, in giving a warm hand to Jens Kent Rasmussen, chairman of the Willem Foundation, and Lugge Ostrup Lunde, who is the chair of the boards of Velux Fonten and the Velux Stiftung. And they will enlighten us, as I said, a little more on what is going to happen. So please take the stage, Jens Kern Rasmussen. Dear prize winners, dear boards and committee, dear guests, a very warm welcome to all of you, and also those of you watching from afar, as Adam said. It is a great honor for me to stand here as chair of the board of Willem Fonten to present the Daylight Award 2022. This year is a special year to all of us. This is the spring where we all get to meet in person to celebrate the daylight after the last couple of years filled with quarantines and restrictions and cancellations. This year, we get to meet and greet each other in this beautiful, partly daylight, daylit room on the UNESCO International Day of Light. And we get to be surrounded by what it is all about today, daylight. The Daylight Award is presented by the philanthropic foundations Willem Fonten, Velux Fonten, and Velux Stiftung, all established by engineer Willem Kern Rasmussen, my grandfather. And yours as well. Indeed. As, <laughs> as many of you might know, Willem Kern Rasmussen was the engineer and entrepreneur behind a novel construction for the rooftop window, which he called Velux. V for ventilation, and Lux is the Latin for light. With this invention, he opened up many new architectural possibilities while delivering daylight and fresh air, and many dark attics of post-war buildings transformed into bright and comfortable rooms. He moreover founded Velux and a number of other companies in the VKR group, whose mission it is to bring daylight, fresh air, and better environments into people's everyday lives. We can therefore proudly say that the initiatives in all three foundations supporting a wide range of nonprofit purposes in scientific, social, cultural, and environmental projects in Denmark, Switzerland, and internationally are all based on a wish to give back to society. Each foundation has their own board of directors and trustee detailing the types of projects they support. And in 2021, the three foundations gave grants of approximately 255 million euros. Willem Fonten supports research in the technical and natural sciences, as well as environmental, social, and cultural projects in Denmark and abroad. Velux Fonten supports scientific, cultural, social, and environmental projects that seek to advance an informed, open, inclusive, and sustainable society. The Foundation's priority areas are active senior citizens, ophthalmology, and gerontology. Vilux Stiftung is supporting science in daylight research, especially daylight and humans, daylight and nature, and daylight technology, as well as healthy aging, and ophthalmology. The foundation moreover funds research in sustainable forestry in conjunction with climate change and biodiversity promoting initiatives. Independent from the company behind, the three foundations have joined forces in the Daylight Award to honor and support daylight research and daylight in architecture. 
for the benefit of human health, well-being and for the environment. Today, we celebrate the ones who make an extra effort in working with Daylight by granting them the Daylight Award 2022. With these awards, made possible by the thousands of employees working in the VCAR group and thus originating from ventilation and light, we are very proud to contribute to the celebration of Daylight through the Daylight Award, which Lykke Aarstrup Lunde will tell us a little more about. Lykke? Thank you. Yes, so I will tell you a little bit about the Daylight Award and uh, the setup we have today. Through the Daylight Award, the three foundations wish to emphasize the importance of daylight. Daylight being one of the only resources left on the planet that is available to all, as well as free at the same time. Daylight is somehow connected to most of what we do, uh, be it humane sciences, social sciences, medicine, literature or art, or maybe just relaxing in our gardens. Uh, in short, uh, it is relevant to all of us and to our daily lives. Through the Daylight Award, the three foundations wish to encourage the quest for knowledge about daylight and the impact it has. Uh, we wish to inspire innovation on the applications of daylight. And overall, we want to raise the awareness of what daylight does for us and the ecosystem that we are a part of. By celebrating some of the most inspiring researchers and architects who have worked with daylight, um, in an intentional way, we hope to inspire all of you here tonight uh, to show you that daylight uh, might be an entry point uh, you hadn't thought of in your own research or daily work, or maybe you have, but uh, there might be something uh, you hadn't thought about that you might discover tonight or later on. It isn't possible for us to bring all of you to Copenhagen to celebrate the Daylight Award, um, but COVID uh, taught us that that's not necessary uh, it also wouldn't be a very sustainable thing to do, and since we also try to work with sustainability, um, we're somehow happy not to fly in all of the people who potentially could be here. Uh, the internet might get the blame for a lot of things, um, but today we want to take time to appreciate the internet. It's making it possible for us to reach uh, a much bigger group of people than would ever have been possible at a physical event, and without flying you around the globe. We hope that you will join our online community, the ones of you who haven't done it already. Uh, if you not do it tonight while you're sitting here with your phones, then you can maybe do it once you come back home tonight or maybe tomorrow morning. For the people who are joining the award online, uh, we also want to thank you for being not here but there. And uh, we hope that you have a great experience uh, with us wherever you may be located. The online community is meant to be an opportunity to meet like-minded people across the globe, a possibility to exchange knowledge about daylight around the clock, even when it's dark. Um, at the same time, we would also like to uh, thank everybody who has showed up here in blocks uh, to make it a festive uh, celebration of the laureates of the Daylight Award 2022. I would like to wish all of you an enjoyable evening, or maybe morning, depending on where you join us from. Um, and then I would like to give the word to uh, the laureate, one of the laureates of 2022, uh, 2020, Russell Foster, who is a former laureate and now a jury member, and uh, Russell will be joining us or will be sending a greeting over the screen. Thank you. A very good day to everybody. My name is Russell Foster and I'd like to send my very warmest congratulations to the Daylight Award Laureates of 2022. I'm immensely sorry I can't be with you today, but I know you're going to have a great deal of fun at the, at the celebrations today. So what's my excuse? Why aren't I with you today? Well, I've spent the last two years writing a new book called Lifetime, The New Science of the Body Clock and How It Can Revolutionize Your Health. And the launch of the book coincides precisely with the Daylight Award ceremony. And so I have to be in London for a whole range of television and, and, and radio interviews. I've been asked to speak about two things. First of all, as the laureate for research in 2020, and also my experience as a member of the jury that elected the 2022 uh, laureates. 
So let's start with uh, being elected as the Laureate for Research for 2020. Becoming the Laureate for Research in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic meant that I was unable to have an award ceremony and I'm terribly jealous of all of you getting together for the ceremony today. But receiving the award during the worst stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, before the rollout of the vaccine, uh, provided a wonderful source of, of joy during a very bleak time indeed. Indeed, I remember being notified of the award very vividly. I was sitting at my desk when Per's email pinged into the inbox um, uh, saying that I was the research laureate. Uh, it was completely and utterly unexpected. I didn't even know I had been nominated. So following the shock and rather overwhelmed by the honour, uh, a celebratory glass of champagne soon followed and we sat in the garden in the sun and I have to say that a glass of champagne never tasted as good. The recognition that followed after getting the award has been wonderful at multiple levels and I'd just like to mention two. The first is that my colleagues in the lab who are building upon the original discoveries that we made were excited to see that their area of science was being recognised as important. We academics don't often get much feedback unlike architects who build a beautiful building that can be seen all the time and admired. You architects in the audience have something that we scientists crave, and that's instant gratification, or at least that's how it appears to us. And the award gave us all in the team some long-awaited gratification. And the second part of the recognition has been that so many people wrote uh, congratulating me on the award. Both people I knew, uh, but also complete strangers. And it was very exciting to see that work that we had started in the late 80s and spanned the 1990s and the turn of the century, which was originally ridiculed and, and rejected, was now being embraced by the broader community. It was a, it's a fantastic sensation. OK, so moving on, what were my experiences as a member of the Daylight Award jury? In short, it was an absolute delight and an incredibly positive experience. Each member of the jury was listened to and their opinions were valued by all of the jury. Everybody had done the background preparation to make sure that the correct decisions were being made. And I think it was incredible that all members of the jury contributed. The architects contributed to the discussion relating to the research candidates and the jury members on the research side had clear views on the architect candidates. And what was truly remarkable was the degree to which we all agreed. We all started to bond as friends, uh, which is another reason why I'm so sorry not to be able to join you today to catch up with my old friends on the jury. I'd like to finish by congratulating the laureates once more thanking my fellow jury members for such a terrific experience and of course to express my profound honour for being awarded the Daylight Award for Research of 2020. And on that, I'll now hand back the microphone, as it were, to the chair of the jury. Thank you very much, Russell, and uh, I completely endorse your sentiments, and I was going to say some similar words, but I'll keep my, my uh, presentation brief. Um, and I wish Russell the best of luck with his book launch. Hopefully we will get to see his book very soon. Maybe we should get some free copies. Um, let me, um, it, it gives me great honour to introduce you to the um, uh, jury members, and, and it has been a, a, a fantastic honour to be able to work with them. Um, and you'll see them... Well, they're all sitting here in front of me, and you'll see a list of them come up uh, in a moment. But um, I'll just go from left to right. Dorcha Mandrup, who's an international architect who happens to be based in Copenhagen, also a professor, adjunct professor. Johanny Palasma is um, an architect, a writer, a, a scribe, a poet. I'm not sure what other vocabulary. I can add more, but I haven't got time. <laughs> um, Marilyn Anderson, who is a laureate winner and is a, 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 an internationally eminent um, architectural scientist or building scientist. Um, Ged Volkers, who was the hard-nosed scientist on our committee, kept, us, uh, kept our focus on the, on the issues, uh, but also enjoyed the, the, the engaging with the, with the more philosophical parts of the discussion with great um, um, uh, uh, positivity. Uh, and unfortunately, Anne Lacaton, who is not here today, Anne Lacaton, you, you will know, Lacaton Vassal, the Pritzker uh, Prize winners, 
recently, um, who um, cannot be with us because she's presenting uh, to a, a jury, another jury committee, to hopefully win uh, a, an, an award or a project. Um, so, as I say, it has been a real honour, but just to echo Russell's uh, words, it's been a real pleasure, too, to work with these esteemed um, colleagues uh, and enjoy their company over, over the last two years, almost, that we've been uh, discussing uh, the, the, um, the Daylight Awards. Let me um, uh, summarise what our, uh, our view was on the, on the laureates um, by way of introducing... Um, uh, the, 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 the awards. So, the laureates of the two Daylight Awards for 2020 exemplify common themes. Not only do they represent international excellence in research and practice, they also embody a generous and humanistic spirit with regard to the significance of daylight. The contribution of daylight to enhance quality of life, even to celebrate life, is an intrinsic quality of their work. It is remarkable how they've applied this humanistic approach with a depth of knowledge and a breadth of intentions that belies their humble and detached vision of, the, of their work's importance. And with that, I would like to hand over to um, Marilyn and Gert. <laughs> It is my privilege to introduce the 2022 Daylight Award Laureate for Research. A researcher who has been a true pioneer in a field that brings together natural sciences and human well-being. This is a person with seemingly inexhaustible energy directed towards bridging between different worlds, from neuroscience and biology to arts and architecture, and towards bringing people together a person for who, for over 50 years, has, in an instrumental way, been advancing a so far underexplored field of knowledge that is core to the importance of light, and of daylight in particular, to human health. An unforgettable character, too. Both generous and witty, with impressive outreach, a mentor, and a role model to many. Let's now meet our laureate, on screen. The Daylight Award for Daylight Research is a great surprise and a great honor, for which I'm extremely grateful, since it highlights the field of chronobiology and the growing knowledge of how crucial daylight is for our health and well-being. I have had the fortune to live and work in an extraordinary era where the science of biological rhythms came of age. Fifty years ago, rhythm research was not really taken seriously. There were only a few pioneering scientists looking at rhythms but they did look at a variety of organisms, and even humans. They discovered that the underlying mechanisms controlling the daily cycles of rest and activity, or seasonal reproduction and hibernation, had remarkable similarities across species. And most relevant to us, it was clear that light is the major synchronizing agent, or zeitgeber, of these daily and seasonal cycles in all species, including humans. That was a very important key finding. When I returned to Switzerland with this new clinical tool of light in the early 80s, you can actually imagine the skepsis at the beginning. Nobody really believed that this was something serious. But light has been my main theme ever since. <laughs> We carried out the only study so far of natural daylight therapy in seasonal affective disorder. Half an hour in the morning outdoors worked just as well as half an hour of bright artificial light. The question arose very early on, how to raise the general knowledge and understanding of how we are affected by light exposure. 
Already in 1988, we founded the Society for Light Treatment and Biological Rhythms. In 1994, Michael Terman and I initiated the non-profit website Circadian Environmental Technologies and since 2016, the International and Interdisciplinary Daylight Academy, of which I am a founder member, promotes cooperation between scientists, architects and other professionals with a strong interest in daylight-related topics. Already the research on light's widespread effects on humans has changed the lighting industry and architecture in the last decade. It has initiated new lighting standards to incorporate non-visual effects of light as necessary for health. And it has reawakened interest in the huge potential of daylight to complement artificial light. Recovery from illness can be accelerated by enhanced exposure to daylight. We and many others have collaborated with architects in new hospitals or retirement homes. Schools and workplace also need enough access to daylight. But if young children spend time outside every day, it seems to be a simple strategy to prevent myopia or short-sightedness. So I think we've reached a level of knowledge whereby chronobiologists and architects can talk to each other to improve the quality of the built environment with respect to the health enhancing effects of daylight. One can feel an enormous energy and enthusiasm surrounding the concept of daylight. It's clear that studies under controlled laboratory conditions are necessary to carefully dissect out the relative effects of wavelength, intensity, timing and duration of light exposure on psychobiological functions, which is what the Centre for Chronobiology in Basel has specialised in. My successor, Christian Kajochen and his team, have now initiated the next generation of studies under field conditions. The crucial question that we still haven't answered is, what is a healthy light diet? How much for whom? When do we need light and when do we need darkness? What I do know is that humans need regular morning daylight to set their internal clock to solar time for better alertness, performance and mood during wakefulness and a better sleep at night. My mantra is very simple. Go outside in the morning every day, rain or shine, to get your sight gave a light pulse. This is important for everyone. Anna Wirtz Justice is Emeritus Professor of Psychiatric Neurobiology at the University of Basel and the former head of the Center for Chronobiology in Basel. Anna has published over 450 research papers and review articles. Anna was born in New Zealand, where she undertook her BSc and MSc master before moving to London for her PhD and following research fellowships in Paris, Basel, Bethesda, Anna moved to the Psychiatric University Clinic in Basel, where she built her distinguished career. She became a full professor and head of the Chronobiology and Sleep Laboratory in 1993 and is Emeritus Professor of Psychiatric Neurobiology at the University of Basel Medical School since 2006. She has remained very actively engaged in many scientific boards and societies ever since including as Chair of Chrono History Committee for the Society of Research for Research on Biological Rhythms, as a board member of the Center for Environmental Therapeutics, and as a co-founder and former board member of the Daylight Academy. Light is essential for health, regulating many aspects of our physiology, not at least our circadian rhythms, and sleep-wake cycles. Appropriate light exposure synchronizes the circadian timing system, allowing us to adjust our biology and respond optimally to the varied and profound demands of the day and night circle. Without this daily synchronization, circadian timing systems fail. 
Our biology can no longer deliver the right materials to the correct organs in the right amount at an optimal time of the day. The consequences include, for instance, fluctuations of mood, irritability, impulsivity, or reduced concentration or creativity. Long term, there's an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, cancer, and mental illness. Anna has uh, undertaken pioneering research on how human circadian rhythms and sleep are regulated by light. Defining the key parameters of how light acts as a biological stimulus, including the importance of when we see light, the length of exposure, and the influence of color. Furthermore, Anna has always considered individual variation, embracing rather than ignoring variables such as age, disease status, and light history. Early in her career, Anna appreciated the connections between abnormal light exposure, circadian rhythm disruption, and the impact that this has on mental health. She introduced the use of light therapy to Europe and studied its use on seasonal affective disorders, non-seasonal depression, borderline personality disorders, and dementia. This work allowed Anna and other groups around the world to establish both the scientific and therapeutic application of light as a treatment for different areas of mental illness. This holistic approach led Anna to develop a handbook for healthcare professionals, thereby guiding evidence-based and condition-specific light treatments to improve mental health. In addition, Anna has embedded her science broadly across the public sector. She has and continues to reach out with passion and generosity to numerous other fields in both the natural and more humanistic sciences to convey the importance of the natural day-night cycle on our physiology, including through architecture and the world of art. She has been the driving force behind multiple public lectures, exhibitions, installations, and architecture projects. She has even worked with fashion designers to create light-inspired and much-admired couture. Final sentence. Finally, the jury has, was moved by Anna's immense energy, enthusiasm, and generosity of spirit. She's a superlative teacher, a colleague, role model, and mentor, inspiring the next generation of minds that are passionate about and fascinated by the importance of light and of daylight in particular on human health and well-being. Thank you. Anna. Thank you. Congratulations, Anna. Thank you. It's my very immense much. pleasure to give you the diploma and the medal. Diploma. Glass, no the less. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. It shows the daylight. Thank you. Right. Now I give a lecture. Okay, you can have that one. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. And especially the jury and board of the three Velux Foundations, whom I thank warmly for this unexpected and wonderful honor of the daylight award for research. Thank you. 
I'm not going to be showing beautiful buildings like the next lot. But I'm going to give you an idea of what chronobiology, the science of circadian and seasonal rhythms, with daylight as their, de de their sidegaber or synchronization, has to do with the emotional and physiological response to beautiful buildings. I have to see something. So today's knowledge, most of it comes of, of the effects of light on humans, independent of vision, comes from research on seasonal behavior in hamsters. Day length is the trigger for winter torpor, that's a kind of hibernation, in long winter nights and reproduction in short summer nights. And information about day length is mediated by the duration of the secretion of the pineal hormone melatonin, which is secreted for a long duration in long winter nights and short duration in short summer nights. So how does this link with hamsters have to do with modern light therapy? When I was a visiting fellow at the National Institute of Mental Health in Washington, my colleague Al Louis developed a melatonin assay and showed that this hormone could be suppressed by bright light at night, just as was the case for other organisms. Until then, people had thought that humans are different and that they were uniquely synchronized by social cues and had nothing to do with light. And Herbert Kern, this engineer who had documented his winter depression for over 20 years, read the scientific paper and volunteered as the first patient to be treated with a simulated summer day for his winter depression. And remarkably, it worked. So one patient created a whole new field of therapy. In 1980, though, we thus knew that light is a zeitgeber for humans. It can shift and stabilize the biological clock. But to take the next step and consider light as a drug that can treat major depression was a dramatic event, given that psychopharmacology at that time was very much the core of psychiatric treatment. So the idea of coming treating with light a serious treatment? Well, that was quite fun. 20 years went by of doing research on seasonal affective disorder and light therapy. And then a paradigm-changing discovery with broad consequences occurred, and that was Russell, who discovered, with others, the melanopsin-containing retinal ganglion cells in the eye. Now, we all know about the classical photoreceptors, the rods and cones for vision, but that there was a new kind of photoreceptor, so-called circadian photoreceptor. This was um, rather exciting. And then one discovered that a whole lot of non-visual functions, such as mood and alertness, were actually done by these new photoreceptors. And this changed how our understanding of light affects humans. Light therapy design went through a number of phases, beginning with handmade Australian, <laughs> followed by a stringent Swiss installation to today's classic desktop lamps. Frank Gehry even designed a light sofa for us, which, alas, nobody was willing to build. Until we realized that daylight was the simplest way of getting photons into the brain. We carried out, as I said before, the first and so far only study of the therapeutic effects of a daily walk outdoors in sad patients 
But obviously, this became a very interesting way of considering light, not just as therapy with a light box, but changing behavior. Light as a drug has now evolved into other medical applications listed here. And the Society for Light Treatment and Biological Rhythms uh, develops guidelines and standards, and our nonprofit center for environmental therapeutics is dedicated to educating the public and professionals. We began by studying the clinical manifestations of light deprivation, the black hole of depression. But then we realized the importance of enough light for health, which led, of course, to consideration of the built environment and our own behavior related to the out outdoors. Which brings us to the connection with architecture. I happen to be married to an architect and urban planner. <laughs> Thank you, Hans, for all the insights you have given me into your field over the years, which have enormously expanded my scientific horizons. The link to architecture began when many studies revealed that depressed patients in rooms getting more morning light left hospital more than three or more days earlier than those who were on the other side of the ward. And this, of course, reunited uh, discussion with architects about the importance of daylight in buildings, which they know about already since it's the core of architecture. More than 10 years ago, Colin Fournier and I wrote about the implications of chronobiology for architecture, and in particular about our opposite approaches. The chronobiologists, as scientists, always wanting more data before they can give you a nice design to build a building. Whereas the architects are used to working with ad hoc, with whatever information is available, and not wanting to wait. It really was a very difficult discussion with Colin. <laughs> the lighting industry moved very quickly in absorbing, adapting, and selling the circadian light discoveries creating what they called human-centric lighting. Well, I would ask, do we know enough? And what is the right light diet for health? So many factors play a role in terms of the light source, in terms of the individual response. We've had experience in hospitals, retirement homes, schools, and offices. The LED lighting industry has enormously developed and is including the dynamics of sunlight over the day, but that's not the same as the real thing. But what's important is that new standards that include these non-visual aspects of a light source are being developed and have been established. We are also fortunate to participate in the unique Daylight Academy, where we work together to integrate knowledge about daylight, as in this first overview published in Science magazine. Our working groups have prepared the ground, I hope, for the next stage of daylight research. We have pretty comprehensively addressed the question of what are the differences between daylight and artificial light? What are the gaps in current knowledge? And, more generally, what is the relevance of daylight for us all? So I hand over to the next generation of researchers, and I'm curious about the exciting discoveries they will make. Thanks to LEDs and portable miniature devices, we now have the technology to move from control conditions in the lab to understand daily light exposure in everyday life, an individual's light di diet and its consequences. And we also have 
The Integrative Human Circadian Daylight Platform recently opened at the Center for Chronobiology in Basel, which shows that the future is already now. I think we are beginning to get there. Crossing borders to collaborate with both architects and artists has also been a highlight for me of the last 20 years, since we all work with light in its different manifestations. I have found the interaction with creative artists to be extraordinarily uh, enriching experience, challenging my rather reductionistic scientific approach to the world. And they have been fascinated to discover the physiological and emotional effects of light beyond the aesthetic and functional. So I invite you all to visit Lausanne next year to see many of these and more collaborations in a first art science exhibition about light and circadian rhythms in this beautiful building by Kengo Kuma at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology Lausanne that I am co-curating with Marilyn Anderson, a previous Daylight awardee. Finally, all these studies over the years wouldn't have been possible without remarkable colleagues. I am indebted to Christian Kajochen, my successor at the Center of Chronobiology in Basel, who is continuing at the frontiers of research on light in humans, and to Kurt Kreuchy, my long-term innovative co-worker, who discovered something very important, why we need warm feet to fall asleep. <laughs> and all our students, postdocs, and visiting fellows. And this list is only a few of my, what I call, circadian chronobiology family, the colleagues and friends over the decades with whom it has been a joy to work. And as I said, before, my message is very simple. More light during the day, more darkness at night for health. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Anna, and congratulations. It was a truly interesting lecture. I, uh, for one, learned quite a bit, so thank you very much. We'll I get should hope so. <laughs> I stand here as a humble student, and we'll get the chance to talk a little later with the other lot, as you call them, because we're soon to have their identity revealed. And uh, in order to motivate, and you may sit down, please. Thank you. <laughs> In order to motivate and present the Architectural Award, I would like to invite two other distinguished members of the jury. Architects, writers, philosophers perhaps, revolutionaries, call them what you like, poets even, uh, of great international standing. I'm talking of course about Dode Mendrup and Johanny Palisma. Please. <laughs> And I am very proud and really, really happy to present the 2022 Daylight Award Laureate for Architecture, an architect's office founded by a pair that are both dedicated educators and architects and known for their powerful and delicate approaches to architecture. Their projects are balancing strength and delicacy, and they are widely known for believing in collaboration as well as for their generosity towards colleagues. They have, with very good reason, been awarded with many international prizes. Latest, I can just mention the Pritzker, the Mies van der Rohe, the RIBA gold medal. We don't think there's any more awards after this that you can actually receive, but it's so deserved. Daylight is an evident 
an inseparable aspect of all their designs. So I think this is a very well-deserved award and very natural. And now we'll show the portrait film. We'll meet the architects. Please enjoy. Before you're born, you're contained. And then when you step out into the world, architecture takes on the role of built skin, that you're actually building the container of humanity. Every building made now is really people's reality, that their control or the uh, separation of nature is one thing that is really important to emphasize. So we try to bring in the elements of nature, landscape, um, fresh air, and especially light. So when people are contained within a building, trying to find the quality, uh, either the relation to or protection from the sun is something that we really want to build into our projects. We think it's wonderful that there's an award related to daylight. That's really special. A friend of ours who is a poet once said to us, well, your material is light, isn't it? And I still remember that sentence because we had never really said that to ourselves. And then we started to really think about that, about uh, the materials of architecture, that it's light, it's fresh air, it's wind, it's, it's moonlight, it's uh, sunlight. It was a reminder that light is our material. And in a way, this award reminds us again that light is one of the key materials of architecture. What's amazing about natural light is that it's so varying across the world. It's like that music dance, it's like a free music that people have, and it really affects you emotionally. In Ireland, the light, you could say, is soft. We get beautiful, clear days, but it doesn't have the same intensity as Milan, for instance, where the light penetrates nine meters below the ground. And in uh, Lima, what we found extraordinary is we were always worried about the, about the heat gain. So the, the building cascades towards the north to protect from the sun. So when you're in that building, you don't see the sky, but it's really bright. And that's a really strange experience. And it's, it's beautiful because the, the surface of the building is reflecting the light. And I suppose that's also the thing we talk about a lot, is how do you draw the light in along a surface? Because sometimes when you make a big glass atrium and it's, everything's bright and airy and open, the light doesn't travel in the same way as when you take it along a surface and bring it with you. In terms of the way we work, we're, we're trying to think spatially. What should this place feel like? Should it feel heavy? Should it feel light? Should it be... Uh, very open, does it need to be more episodic and contained or does it need to be labyrinthine? Light is kind of amazing because you learn each time. We really describe architecture as physics of space or the physics of culture. That what we try to do is to capture the light, capture the environmental conditions of location but also that people enjoy that, that when you stand in a certain place that you can open a window or that you're in shade. And when you're standing in Lima in a place, you are aware of the city of Lima, of the Pacific Ocean and of the Andes in the distance. And in Kingston upon Thames, uh, near the Thames in, in uh, London, that you are aware that you are part of that culture. So it's, it's a cultural uh, relationship it's a, a light relationship to do with the angle of the sun. It's one of the, the aspects that we look at very deeply. Before we had actually won the competition, we brought um, two or three of the client members to Milan to see the project. And we were in the space nine meters below ground. And there was one person in particular, and he kept saying, how did you get the light to come down here? How did you do it? How 
did you get her to come down here? You know, it was just fantastic. When light becomes something you're aware of, it's a gift. And it's lovely to have an excuse to enjoy it. I mean, we're, we're biological beings and we need light. And that's, that's it, really, for our spirits, for our souls, for our bodies. Light is an extraordinary energy. It's not just a, a visual delight. It actually is a form of energy. And as we move into the future in a time of sustainability, capturing light is not just good for your eyes and for yourself and whatever, but it's also a form of energy. For us to receive this award is absolutely fantastic. We are really honored. It gives me uh, a feeling of honor and pleasure to, uh, 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 to say something about the background of the winning pair of architects. By the way, this is not the first time I'm doing it, so we are all <laughs> old friends. Grafton Architects were founded in 1978 by Yvonne Farrell, and Shelley McNamara. They graduated from the School of Architecture at University College Dublin in 1974, where they taught from 1976 to 2002 and were appointed as adjunct professors in 2015. Their international academic roles have included visiting professors at EPFL Lausanne, the Kengo, Ken, Kenzo Tanya Chair at GSD Harvard, the Louis Kahn Chair at Yale, and they are currently professors at the Academia di Architettura Mendrisio, Switzerland. They are fellows of the Royal Institute of the Architects of Ireland, international honorary fellows of the Royal Institute of British architects, and elected members of Ars Dana, the eminent Irish art organization. Grafton architects have won numerous architectural awards for their work, including the RIPA's International, um, <coughs> International Prize, Stirling Prize, and Gold Medal in 2020. Yvonne and Shelley were selected as the Pritzker Prize laureates, the highest international honor for architects. Grafton architects have mastered the use of daylight throughout their wide and exceptionally varied design production. They use natural light to differen differentiate and articulate spaces of different importance functional purpose, and experiential atmosphere. Daylight is employed in their design process as an integrated and irreplaceable quality along with the spatial arrangement, structural frame, and technical systems. The skill to direct daylight both vertically and horizontally into often thick and layered building volumes is remarkable. Natural illumination heightens the working conditions and sensory qualities of the spaces. Instead of being merely an element of composition or aestheticization, daylight emphasizes and celebrates the main spaces in their buildings. Natural light in Grafton Architects projects has a relaxed, generous, and calm presence. Yvonne Farrell and uh, Shelley McNamara do not always explicitly describe their approach and concept of daylight in their designs. However, the projects speak for themselves and are e explicit and representative 
of Grafton Architects' attention to the constant integration of daylight in their projects and its specific role. Daylight is evident as an inseparable aspect of their designs. This is most clearly revealed in the sections of their buildings. In Grafton Architects' buildings, the use of the daylight creates beautiful contrasts and illuminates the core of their projects. Daylight produces a comfortable and warm atmosphere in service of the user. The daylight does not create monumentality. It is not a religious or scenographic light. It is a beautiful, soft and humanistic light perfectly merged with architecture. This is light that integrates and creates a unique spatial experience without being demonstrative or imposing. Consistently, in all their projects, Grafton Architects' virtuosity and remarkable use of daylight enables them to conceive thick, deep buildings and to bring the light where it is wanted, necessary and comfortable, to work, to read, to stay. It allows them to create a complex and rich interior architecture, spatially dense, which nevertheless achieves a human scale and intimate environments within tall and large buildings. In some works, surfaces are used as daylight reflectors and modulators. Glazed ceramic floor combined with rough brick walls, silky dark wood, together with carefully placed openings, create rich and intricate spatial experiences. It is clear that daylight is particularly important in Grafton Architects' architecture. It is not an accessory. It is a major constituent element of the architecture. Grafton Architects show a skillful and delicate mastery of daylight, which fully serves an architecture of use for the people who inhabit the spaces and enhances the life of the community. I don't know who gets the check and who gets the medal. No, I'm joking. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Please, uh, thank you. Congratulations. It's a big thank you. It is. <laughs> There's also some words in there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I might bring the table over. Yep, yeah, we'll bring it right up. Thank you. Yeah, it would be nice. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have to get out the machine. Did I have it in my pocket? Oh, thank you. Thank you. To keep an eye on the time. Okay. First of all, we would sincerely like to thank all those involved in nominating us and the jury for choosing us as the recipients of the, this Daylight Award 2022. We are deeply honored just try the first, first one. Okay, we have traveled here today from Ireland and not far to the north from where we live in Dublin, one hour's drive is New Grange. New Grange was constructed about 5,200 years ago, making it older than Stonehenge in England and the Great Pyramids of Giza in Egypt. Built by Stone Age farmers, it's a passage tomb located in the valley of the River Boyne, 
part of a complex designated as UNESCO World Heritage Site. It consists of a mound 85 meters in diameter and 13 meters high. A passage measuring 19 meters long leads to a chamber with a corbelled roof with three alcoves. This passage and chamber are aligned with the rising sun on the mornings of winter solstice. At the entrance to the passage, there's an opening called a roof box. Its purpose is to allow sunlight to penetrate the chamber on the, shorter day, the shortest days of the year, around the 21st of December, winter solstice. At dawn, from the 19th to the 23rd of December, a narrow beam of sunlight penetrates the roof box and reaches the floor of this chamber, gradually extending to the rear of this chamber. As the sun rises, the beam widens within the chamber so that the whole chamber becomes dramatically illuminated. This event lasts for 17 minutes. The accuracy of Newgrange as sunlight catching device is remarkable, consisting as it was, considering that it was built 500 years before the Great Pyramid in Giza and 1,000 years before Stonehenge. This ancient human veneration and respect of the life-giving characteristics of light is evidenced by this wonderful light-giving temple. This is an image that we took in the Doge's Palace in Venice. And we took this photograph and we couldn't understand it. It had two types of natural light, direct sunlight and intense sky illumination reflected on the beautiful polished floor. In Toulouse, in France, this beautiful photograph of the child standing in the Jacobins, a 13th century Dominican monastery, She's standing in this space with sunlight, natural light, acting as a spotlight on the beginning on her beautiful light, or life. This is uh, two photographs from a small project that we get, did in University College Dublin, the Ermid Institute. This building consists of two layers to combine a type of tartan grid. It's a two-story ground level with a roof level on the opposite direction. And what we discovered on the left-hand side, that overlaying these two directions of surfaces and light, that light was held and danced and moved beautifully. This is a small school that we did not far from Dublin. It's for children between the ages of four and 12. In the general purpose hall, the image on the left-hand side, we captured two types of light. A tall periscope window catches south light and bounces it into a vertical wall. And then a high, narrow window allows a shaft of sunlight from the south into this 200 square meter room. On the right hand side, in each tall classroom full of natural light from high level uh, windows, we included a little two meters by two meters by two meters plywood line space with its own intimate scale, with small child scale windows. In Bocconi University in Milan, we used three natural periscope lights in the Aula Magna to bring light into this internal room. And the lower image is a nine meter high daylight capturing light from the street, which hovers Hovering above is a 22-meter cantilever of the Aula Magna. And we used, in this one here, in this image, in the same building, we used a beautiful marble called Bianca Laza. Five meters below ground or nine meters below ground, we learned that light bounces like a ball to illuminate levels below. We love the Basque Spanish sculpture, Chilida because he has the ability to make work that seems to trap light and generate light from within. In our project, in the image below, the model of the Institut Mines Telecom in Paris-Saclay, the main entrance is from the north, and in order not to have a shadowed north facade, 
we positioned a light screen, like a suspended veil, across the entrance in order to catch light and animate the entrance area. In our recently completed London School of Economics, which has a 55-meter facade facing Lincoln's Inn Fields, the largest public square in London, this facade is also facing north. We did not want to have a somber, cold, shadowed facade. We carved the plan. We manipulated the plan to have voids which capture light. We angled fins on the deep north facade to catch afternoon light and bounce warm sunlight animating the north-facing lantern facade. If this clock is right, I have three minutes left. <laughs> So we'll give Shelley two extra because I was supposed to have five each. Is that all right? Okay. We asked the jury, they have said yes. For, first of all, I think the words that you used describing our work were, were incredible. So we really thank the jury for this um, beautifully sculpted, poetic description of, of our work. We really appreciate that. Um, I'm just reminded by this image that Yvonne has finished with, one of the um, uh, quotes that we really love, uh, and it, it related to a rhythm of columns, not a rhythm in relation to a facade, was um, Louis Kahn describing structure as the maker of light. And he talks about a column catching the light, and then the space between the column is no light, and does this thing of light, no light, light, no light. And just to describe structure in terms of light is something we found really uh, beautiful. And just talking about um, Toulouse, Yvonne showed the image of the Jacobin cloister, but one of the things we loved in Toulouse in the old Roman uh, city is that the main window is to the sky because of the scale of the courtyard. So the, these courtyards full of uh, zenithal light. And in the building that we made in uh, Toulouse, we thought about it being like a, a sundial because it, it rotates, it's a peculiar shape site. It has a central heart lit from above. And also what we try to do is to make a connection between the inside and the outside world spatially, but all, also in terms of light. And this image shows students standing, looking towards the light of the hot city, but standing in the coolness of the social centre of this building. And because it's like a, a sundial with a central space, the light is continually uh, changing. And, and that's something that's so important. So that it, the, the, the space around which the professors and the students rotate is also the space that gathers the light and is also uh, changing. And in the video, we mentioned the thing of Lima and the extraordinary discovery that in Lima that the fog feels like liquid light because it hurts your eyes, because it's refracting the light. And we'd never experienced that intensity of light before. And that's why this space feels like a, a cave, but full of light, because you don't see the, the source of the light, but the light penetrates and is uh, reflected. And then, of course, wood um, reacts very differently to light. We also know that wood, we don't just feel good in wooden buildings because of the color and the sensual quality of wood, but it reacts to the air and to climate in different ways. And we're discovering that because of the way it deals with humidity, that it actually makes you feel more comfortable. And it seems, wood seems to somehow absorb the light in a very different way and somehow focus on itself and on its grain and on its texture. And we're reading an article recently called The Philosophy of Trees. And what we found wonderful about this article was Japanese a uh, Japanese architect speaking about the Japanese uh, craft of using wood and how the trunk of trees, certain trees, that the south-facing part of the trunk is full of no uh, knots and, and, and um, text different textures, whereas the north is smooth because the wood 
absorbs the sun in a different way to the north. And these craftsmen feel that when the tree is cut down and it's used again, that the south-facing surface should still be facing south and the north-facing facing north, because then it won't crack. And so there's this beautiful thing of the, the, the kind of um, full relationship between a material and sunlight and light. And then, of course, brick is is completely different thing. And something we, we're really concerned about is the not just the interior spaces in relation to light, but the space of cities, the space of the streets. And again, this building in Toulouse beside a medieval wall absorbs the red light of the evening sun. And brick, because it's made of small uh, elements, breaks up the light in different ways. It's like... Uh, a complex kind of weave, uh, a complex kind of material. And in Dublin, our own city, um, Elizabeth Bowen, uh, writer, wrote um, uh, Seven Cities. She thought that the, 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 the winter lived in the city and the summer lived in the country because this book was written about her memories of growing up in Dublin in the winters. And she talked about the red cliffs of the brick walls um, that, that they absorbed the light like an unopened orange seals up the juice. And we really liked that description of, um, of Dublin, Dublin walls. And just finishing with Le Thorine, uh, which I visited and found one of the most amazing buildings I've, I've been to see in a very long time. And this image reminds... Um, me of um, a quote by uh, uh, Perrodin, a really brilliant French architect, and he, he, writing about Sphere Fen, he talked about architecture being a machine for slowing time down. And somehow this... Can I go back? No, I'm finished. I got cut off. Do I? No. 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 So. OK. No. <laughs> mm. um, just that it's the stillness uh, the stillness of this light. Uh, and then when we were in um, Barcelona last week, the opposite happened. We were in Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion and the, the, the courtyard was reflecting the light of a, a flag blowing in the wind. And because the light was falling on a corner, it was mirrored. So you got this, this shadow um, dancing up and down the wall of the Barcelona Pavilion. But it, it was mirrored, so it became like a big bird that was um, dropping down and coming up and disappearing and then coming back. And we were doing an interview and we were trying to focus, but this was just a mesmerizing thing to watch, which we just couldn't take our eyes off. And that's one of the wonderful things about the movement of light. And that poet who said to us, um, uh, light is your material, isn't it? that we quoted from in the, um, the video, um, has written a poem called Binaries, and I'm just going to read a few lines, where he says, everything we experience, everything we feel, has its opposite. As day has night, heat has cold, youth, age, dark, light. Consider the encompassing light, revealing, defining, enriching, repealing the, the disabling dark. How marvelous the light. But then there is also the dark, concealing, hiding, removing, nullifying the cruel clarities, conducive to a sleep and a forgetting. Who could live without dark? And I didn't know what Anna was going to speak about, but in a way it seems amazing that this poem captures what you call the human circadian rhythm and cycle and the need for the light and the dark. So thank you, everybody, for this wonderful <laughs> honour. Congratulations, and thank you for another wonderful lecture. Actually, you're supposed to...
remain on stage because uh, I would like to invite our three laureates to come back on stage to have the Q&A. Uh, actually, time, as you know, is a crude master. We were supposed to finish by now, but um, due to passion, and passion is what runs through everything, uh, we're slightly delayed, but I hope you'll all accept this delay because this is exactly why we're here, because people have something on their mind, something to fill them. So please take a seat yep. up here once again. And while I'm just, ah, um, sorry, football injury, um, <laughs> I will remind you what Oops. I said initially, <laughs> that you can all join with questions. We have about 20 minutes for this Q&A. And those of you who are joining us via the transmission, there is a link and you know where to find it. You click it and you just write your question. And those of you in here, you can scan the QR code and you can, on your smartphone, write a question. And if you write the question, please make it fairly short. Uh, and I hope we have time. I'll be looking at the um, screen, which is a far cry away from me. So if you don't mind, I'll be moving closer to you because I forgot my reading glasses. It's <laughs> very nice. Anyway, congratulations once again. Uh, I made a note when Cohen uh, gave his introduction, and he talked about the generous, and I believe he said, humanistic experience or spirit uh, that runs through the work that each of you have done. I wonder, yeah, he said so, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could perhaps initially comment on that. What is implied by this humanistic approach? Yvonne. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful term. Uh, humanistic approach, it's being aware of the fact that we are all human and that built into presumably uh, research but also in terms of architecture, that how do you manage to remember what it's like to be a human? How do you have a seat that's the right... If you take your Knudsen, for example, one of the most amazing things about a seat outside his house, Can Lease in, uh, in Majorca, is that even though the seat is made of uh, concrete and tile, mm -hmm. because he, as an architect, has thought about the, the position of your uh, leg, your, how you sit, how you hold your back, the concrete and tile has been transformed into silk. It holds you. So the humanistic element of architecture is really thinking about who is receiving the architecture. It's architects being, uh, thinking about what the choreography of life, how you come home, how you open your door, how you open the windows in where you are. So it's being as human as possible. Humanistic is really thinking of what is the great pleasure to be alive and how can architecture enrich that even more. Mm -hmm. And Shelley, I take it that Yvonne is speaking on behalf of Grafton Architects, so i go on to Anna. Uh, same question, basically. How do you see the humanistic approach in your work? Well, I'm a scientist, but I happen to do experiments with humans <laughs> in the sense of trying to find out how we function, particularly brain function, neurobiology, and the reason for doing that is, of course, a basic curiosity about the world itself. Mm -hmm. But since I've always worked in a psychiatric clinic, it's very close to finding ways of treating mental illness and other illnesses that, uh, yeah, are useful. <laughs> it's very simple. Right, yeah. I, I, I was just making a note, as I said, when Cohen mentioned the work, because I find that the term humanism these days is, uh, is quite... Um, uh, is often received in a rather critical way. So when you have laureates who actually are being praised for their humanistic approach, I just, you know, I just wanted you to elaborate a bit on that. Now, Shelley, you are teaching the two of you. You're lecturing at many schools of architecture all over the world. You meet a lot of students. I wonder what is your perhaps key or most central advice to the students of architecture that you meet when it comes to, to daylight? Um, well, I, I suppose we, we teach in the way that we work mm. uh, to a large degree. We're, we're not kind of academic specialists like maybe you are. Mm -mm. Um, we're, we're more uh, intuitive practitioners and we, 
We try to teach students what spaces feel like and why they feel the way they feel. And architecture is a combination of, of science and intuition, and it's a combination of pragmatics as well as rational. Uh, and, and that's one of its um, challenges, but also one of the wonderful things about, about architecture. And what we find wonderful about teaching is that um, young students don't know so much or they don't know as much as we do, but that liberates them mm -hmm. to think about space in a very fresh way. And one of the things we often ask students to do is to make a drawing of something that remembe resembles what we're asking them to, to design, for instance, uh, a memory of a, of a warm wall, a memory of a, a shadowed space. Uh, because it's also interesting that we're speaking about daylight, but that also affects temperature and temperature of surfaces is a very important physical result of daylight, the south-facing wall, which feels warm to the touch, which I think is so important in cities to try to think about a surface that, that um, makes people feel good if they lean against it, or that creates shade in, in the hot sun, or um, gets you out of the rain. That, Architecture is so complex. There's so many things it can invite the user to do. So I suppose we, we really just try to teach students how to think about space and how to think about pleasure and how to think about light <laughs> as one of the key components of that. Right. And is there more focus on that now than like when you were students? We heard you, Henny, say that you graduated in 1974. How, how much did daylight as a material figure in, in your education? Uh, I think that we were aware of, you know, the impact of light, but what is amazing about, uh, say, today's focus or the, this award is that it takes, it's really focusing on it as a material. That, um, uh, you know, we were talking earlier on about how simple and beautiful the Pantheon is, you know, that mm. you have a hole in the roof and yet it is, it just holds a space and makes a space. In terms of what it was in 1974, um, I think we, uh, in terms of our education, buildings came like the way the stork delivers babies. You know, they came fully fledged, <laughs> and not the process of design. <coughs> so I think that it's good now that that uh, uh, elements of, of design are discussed with students. And also in terms of energy, I mean, that light, we've talked about that light is a form of energy as we move to the future. That, and also because we've all lived through, luckily through a pandemic, we realize that opening a window, mm -hmm. listening to a bird song, natural light and natural ventilation really help. I mean, and it's confirmed by the, the, the yeah, scientist absolutely. laureate that we are human creatures and that mm -hmm. the world is, uh, is there to be enjoyed and captured through architecture. Right. And I find it extremely fascinating, y your lecture. Obviously, you've been undertaking a long journey, not just in geographical terms from New Zealand to Sw Switzerland via London, but in, in scientific terms. Uh, could you just go back to the paradigm that you were fighting against or that you were up against? Because it would seem to me that going back to the heavy 80s, 1980s, uh, what you presented to the scientific world, your discoveries and what you and your colleagues were working at, was somehow considered to be slightly off, as if you were, you know, a bit bonkers. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> But you have to remember that biological rhythms were originally called biorhythms, and they had very little scientific basis. And in the last 50 years, this field has come of age in that so many scientists are working on circadian rhythms that are in bacteria, fungi, plants, uh, hamsters, our favorite animals, mice, and even in humans. And the genetic basis of these circadian rhythms was found about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And when something has a genetic basis in science, it's taken much more seriously than just something that goes up and down and up and down. Mm -hmm. And of course, 
as a field, we were absolutely delighted and honored and justified, as it were, when the molecular biologists who worked on these clock genes got the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 2017. And that was absolutely wonderful because it made our field respectable. Right. It's not that we're not respectable, <laughs> but the science um, was done by so many different fields, as I said, people working in plants and in humans, and yet we had this common genetic and physiological and behavioral basis that we could use in any organism we're looking at. And it's the most beautiful science. It just is gorgeous. Right. And it's useful. <laughs> we should look it up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at the screen, and there is a question from Mandana Khani. It says, inspiring to have three female awardees. What is your advice for the younger generation of researchers, architects? I think I'll go with you again, Anna, because I somehow asked um, Shelley that question before. But if you could take it up, Anna, please. Just be curious and don't follow the main road and let yourself be dwarfed by too many problems from the establishment. Right. <laughs> Mandana, I don't, that's good. <laughs> I don't know if the Mandana is actually in the room or if she's uh, following us via digital link. Oh, you are here, right, okay. If you, if you do what Anna just said, you end up here in, let's say, 20 years with your medal. <laughs> um, do you have something yeah, to add? I, I think that just in terms of advice is that uh, to move forward in any discipline, it's really about uh, ensuring that your value system is robust. That the value system, you're highly privileged to be a scientist, one is highly privileged to be an architect, and that you are public servants. You know, you are in a discipline that actually, since 2008, um, more of the world is living in built form than, uh, mm. than not. So that what people will be living in in the future is more and more built. So the built environment, understanding what the science is now telling us, but also the human values of, uh, and, and virtue of the beauty of the world. And that everywhere on the earth is different. And that architects have the opportunity to heighten that sense of where you are on this planet. So. I would encourage you to stay alive is a good thing, and then to have <laughs> a series, a series of, of value systems that are uh, giving to, to others. Very good piece of advice, stay alive. Um, another question, how do you guys <laughs> see, uh, how do you guys see how daylight can help transform the green agenda? It's a question from Greta. Big Sustainability. question. Big question, yeah. Uh, seven minutes to go, anyone? <laughs> Woo. Shelley? Well, I'm just thinking of Le Brust when he was designing uh, libraries. And the libraries were designed to maximize the number of hours uh, where people could read because um, the, the, the electric light it wasn't there, it was gas light. And uh, so the thing of, and places of work, factory spaces, like it, they're wonderful big roof lights and windows to um, prolong the day, to prolong the daylight, reduce the amount of electric light that needed to be used. And, and they lead to beautiful spaces. And somehow when we started to rely on artificial mm -hmm. light and not to value daylight properly, we became more blasé about, about that. I mean, daylight is like gold dust in terms of the green agenda because mm. It, 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 it reduces energy consumption, it makes its well-being, as we know, and as you have proven. Uh, and so it's, it's, I mean, the thing that's interesting about architecture is it's as old as time and it's as young as you make it. It's, it's, it's a spiralling um, thing. Time is a spiral in architecture, it's not a linear thing. And uh, Le Brust talked about the healing power of architecture in his work, which is a beautiful term that architecture could heal uh, and make people feel good. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Anna, your scientific response to this question, which touches on uh, environmental uh, issues, uh, sustainability, etc., the green agenda. You said it's a big question, it surely it's is. It's a big question, but we're living in a 24-7 society where light is available all the time, and I think we've forgotten that the rhythm of light and darkness, the changing day length with season, is our archetypal environment. And the science and the architecture, we're working together somehow to go back to a more natural lifestyle. Hmm. And of course, the more natural we are, the less electricity we use. Hmm. But it's, as I said, it's a difficult and big question. Could, right. could I yeah, add yeah, to something absolutely, there? Absolutely. That, that when we were involved in the, in the Venice Biennale, the architecture uh, mm -hmm. Biennale of 2018, one of the first things that we did to enjoy the space of the Corderie, which is 300 meters mm -hmm. long, uh, a shed that um, Galileo was in, where it had thousands of workers. Over the years before, layers and layers of the natural daylight and the natural beauty had been kind of uh, crustated and mm -hmm. forgotten about. Sometimes we forget about the most natural things. So what we did was we took away all the layers and exposed it for its own beauty. Sometimes we just forget the most ordinary things. Really good windows, beautiful daylight, gorgeous volumes. So sometimes it's peeling back history. Right. I guess one <laughs> obvious question that I should have asked initially is how do you <coughs> think... Excuse me. Do you need water? No, I'm grand. All right, okay. Thank you, excuse me. Uh, I don't see any water, by the way. <laughs> so, so, so it's very free of charge to, to be of assistance. Now, uh, one thing, uh, one question I should have perhaps asked initially is, how do you think this Daylight Award will strengthen the collaboration around, you know, the research that you do, Anna, and the work you undertake as architects? Well, I hope it will. <laughs> I think the Daylight Award, which has in the last, for research, beginning with Marilyn and then Russell and myself, it's been the era where chronobiology really came of age and that the lighting industry and architects and planners realized the importance of daylight for everyday life. And this it's just growing. We, we are still working on this and we are talking across cultures to architects and to planners in order to apply what we've learned, how important daylight is. I mean, I did all my research with artificial light, mm -hmm. light boxes, because in the lab you can control the, the wavelength, the intensity, the duration, the spectrum and so on. And going out into the real world to try and find out what is the important amount and quality of light that we need for health, you can't do that without having the lab studies beforehand to change one thing at a time and find out the crucial elements. So it's always going to be a mixture of basic research in the lab and with the techniques we have now going out into the field. And that's where it's going to impact on daily life, on behavior, on architecture, and city planning. Hmm. And what about you, Yvonne Shelley? Seen from your perspective, seen from the line of work that you do, how, how do you lean on the work that researchers such as Anna are undertaking? Well, we haven't had the opportunity or the pleasure of working with somebody like on a, on a team, which we would it's love coming to have. <laughs> It's coming up. Yeah, we spoke about this the minute we met, actually. Um, but we do work with environmental mm -hmm. um, designers, and what's fantastic is that they can engineer, do the engineering studies to, to, to check and to refine and to modulate what is one's instinct, and not just in terms of um, the, the light levels, but for instance, the shading levels, because that's a real issue in, in architecture. The building in Toulouse, the walls all fold in different ways, depending on the orientation. And that was engineered and helped by the 
environmental um, engineers to actually see well what works and doesn't work. So that collaboration is hugely uh, important in terms of environmental um, design. But Yvonne, um, do you, I heard exactly what Shelley said, but I, I still wonder, do you have any sort of concrete plans of collaborating with the researchers? I think what's really uh, wonderful is to hear uh, the, the conclusions that your deep research has uh, ha has found. You know, it's it's proven. You know, you've proven that it's good to ha be able to sleep. How do we make places that are dark enough to to sleep? How do you wake up in the morning facing east and hearing the, or watching the the rising sun? How do you get going out for half an hour in the morning? What I, what I think is fantastic is that at one level, it's proving the ordinary. It's mm -hmm. proving the, you know, this is what one should do. Mm. And that built into what architecture should be is to, is to capture those things. That it isn't about some secret that we're not going to tell anyone about. It's about really beautiful, tall windows that you can... I mean, all of us have been... Uh, lucky enough, or those who have been lucky enough to be in a beautiful tall ceilinged room with uh, two windows that open to a balcony and the rising sun is coming in. Whether it's in a place in Greece or in uh, parts of the United States, wherever it is, there's a beauty about the ordinariness. Yeah. And maybe going back to that question, maybe it's capturing the beauty of the ordinary is really what architecture is about. It isn't a kind of a trick that only four people know in the world and we're not telling you. <laughs> it's actually the beauty of a tall ceiling, a gorgeous view, a bounce light like Shelley was describing, a light on brick becomes warmer because it's touching an orange, the orange of the surface. So I think it's really to, to realise that we have ordinary materials that we can transform and it's confirmed by the scientific. That's when I heard Anna speak about her work. That's the encouragement, I think, is that the ordinary, the real, is what you have proven to be true. The biology has always been there, mm. and now we have it explicitly, mm. that what you know instinctively in terms of mm. light and temperature and the environment, that it actually is real. Mm. And it changes our behavior, it changes our mood, mm -hmm. it changes our health. Mm -hmm. Very simple, eh? Mm. I think we could go on for a long time because there are several questions that need to be asked. But if you look at the screen, it says in very dramatic words, over time, <laughs> and there is a red clock blinking. So I believe our time is almost up. Um, I just want to ask you one thing, Anna, perhaps a bit of the subject. Why is it important to have warm feet when you fall asleep? <laughs> I, I never thought you, of that. I have you say. been camping? Uh, several times, uh, one too many actually. And you have freezing feet and you can't fall asleep. Yeah. Well, Kurt Kroeke in his studies did a lot of experiments to try and find out what thermoregulation how important it is for falling asleep. It's our hands and feet that need to be warmed up. We're not talking about core body temperature, we're talking about the distal skin temperature. So bed socks, a warm bath, hot water bottle, etc., etc. God, this is the day of really <laughs> this good is advice. Very <laughs> and a hat, a bed hat. <laughs> You know, it sounds so simple. It's what I'm saying before. The biology is there, but in order to dissect out the causality, that's what is so nice about some aspects of science. You just get surprised by the everyday. That's amazing. I think you deserve another medal, or, or a Christian does, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we should give a very warm applause to our three laureates. Thank you very much. That's great. <laughs> we, um, you'll get the chance to applaud them later and to chit-chat in a very few minutes uh, over a good glass of wine, uh, perhaps a beer, if you like. Uh, you know, it's customary that uh, the moderator rounds off this event. And usually, I've done this numerous times, I'm always extremely boring, because uh, unlike you, I'm not part of the community. I'm a historian turned journalist, and all of you will be seated with frozen faces saying, what is the guy trying to do if he tries to summarize and round off the day? So uh, clever people here, 
thought of an alternative way, a more poetical way of rounding off this award. Isn't that right, Sarah? Our biggest design flaw as human beings is that we forget easily and we take things for granted. We get comfortable and forget to appreciate the simple moments. Moments that may seem mundane when they're happening. Moments that are not eventful enough to become memories. Like your first sip of coffee in the morning. You know, the quiet sip? Before your house awakes, before you check your agenda and read your emails. Right when your body's stretching the night away, getting ready for another day. How many times have you opened your windows, filling your home and heart with daylight? You bring the outside in, letting the rays warm your skin. Countless of times, I'm sure. Yet how many of those times do we actually remember? Today, we take a moment, a moment to appreciate and honor the minds that don't forget. We owe them tonight where we collectively remember the importance of daylight. Today is a celebration of accomplishments that leads to genuine change. So we celebrate the architects that bring buildings to life, from an idea sparked to an outline sketched, to letting the walls of their creations take their very first breath. Their work is not just concrete, they imagine environments that inspire, creating spaces that we can't help but admire. But let's be honest, only architects truly appreciate architects. <laughs> Because the rest of us only appreciate the result of their hard work. We like places that make us feel good. However they came to be is not something we ponder. But being here today, you start to understand how their work is a genuine wonder. We celebrate our health by celebrating the dedicated shoulders of our researchers. I'm talking late nights and long hours of working tirelessly to understand the light inside us all, what makes it shine brighter and how it can help us to stand tall. We eat healthy, we exercise, we read and write, neglecting the fact that what we also need is time outside. The impact that daylight has on our health is infinite from treating the body to understanding our minds. So let us salute our researchers' commitment and their truly remarkable scientific finds. Hell, daylight can probably save your marriage. <laughs> Ask your spouse to leave the house and let them reflect in daylight. And don't let them back into the house until they've truly seen the light. And that's the end of that fight. And this is why I recommend that you never fight at night. You're welcome. <laughs> Today, we celebrate the community of light, from the architects to the researchers, from the jury to the people in the beginning of their journey, from the curiosity of the younger fingers to the commendable successes of role models on stage tonight, to every single one of you tuning in online. The potential today makes the shadows hide. It removes the unnecessary divide. So to foster collaboration, I invite you to listen to your imagination. Because daylight is infinite in its generosity. And so are the opportunities in this room. You are all building bridges, supporting the foundation of a brighter future. Brick by brick, thought by thought, day by day, spark by spark, exchanging knowledge with inquisitive hands and open hearts. Today we celebrate the extraordinary, the above and beyond. We celebrate the joint efforts of two fields, making this award a celebration of life. So, let us celebrate words spoken. Let us take them with us when we leave, as memories, as small tokens. How do quotes become quotes? Well, I think that quotes become quotes on nights like this. Capturing the beauty of the ordinary, that is architecture. We, are all, we all work with light within its different manifestations. Light is kind of amazing because you learn each time. What is a healthy light diet? How much for who? And when do we need light? And when do we need darkness? So if anyone ever tells you that scientists and architects are not poets, <laughs> you can tell them that they're wrong. Our biggest design flaw as human beings is that we forget easily 
and we take things for granted. However, the achievements of Yvonne Farrell, Shelley McNamara, and Anna Vias Justice makes it easier for us to remember and easier for us to appreciate and endorse that the Light and Dem is by far a powerful force. Thank you so much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You've just been applauding the wonderful Sarah Rame, spoken word artist, poet, actress, writer, and she knows what she's talking about. So thank you very much, Sarah. I should like to say now, thank you very much to the audience. Thank you very much to those of you who've been watching this transmission. Thank you, of course, to the foundation who have made it all possible. And once again, thank you very much to the laureates. To repeat myself, if you go one floor up, and I don't mean to heaven, of course, but one physical floor up, you'll find a great variety of uh, whatever you crave, drinks um, of certain orders. Uh, you can even have coffee. Most importantly, you can talk to each other and you can listen to music. So once again, have a nice evening and thank you very much. <laughs>